Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Kandel, and my talk today is about functional CSS. Uh, as developers, we've seen the growing influence of functional programming uh, in all of our tools. And we can consider, for example, the dispatch function in Redux or composability in uh, React components. Uh, even JavaScript syntax has evolved to encourage writing in a functional manner. And there's a reason for this trend, because building up small deterministic functions to create code makes software that's easy to understand, to extend, to test, and maintain. Um, now, while it might not seem obvious at first, our designs can benefit if we take that same approach and apply it to our CSS. But CSS isn't a programming language, and it's already pretty composable, right? Well, that's true. CSS classes do give us modularity, but if we look at other elements of functional programming, uh, we can see that CSS doesn't quite stack up. So, in functional programming, <laughs> yeah, um, in functional programming, we assert that our functions will have no side effects. But let's imagine this bug uh, we've just been tasked with fixing, where one of our application's components has the wrong text color. The component works everywhere in our application except for the header, and we're going to pretend that this component style are governed by its own CSS class. Um, if we're trying to fix this, what's going to happen if we go ahead and change the text right in that class? We're probably going to break it somewhere else, right? But it might fix our issue. But we're going to have this side effect where, by changing our style, we've caused a bigger problem. It's broken everywhere else in the app except the header. So in order to avoid these side effects, it's pretty common to copy the selector in our CSS file, add greater specificity, like dot header and then whatever the class name was, uh, and make some minor adjustment. And now our CSS is starting to balloon. We're going to get classes that are very similar, and the only difference being these slight changes in specificity. If we keep working in this manner, our style sheet's going to continue to grow. And regardless of what preprocessors or frameworks or libraries, we're going to have an ever-growing CSS file. Um, which would make, make us think, if we, can we fix this with any less effort? Right? And what would it look like if we had deterministic style functions that didn't have all these consequences? It actually looks really similar. In functional CSS, we're still going to have a reference style sheet, uh, just like we do in any of our projects. But our style sheet is going to have classes where each one uh, does exactly one thing whether it's setting the padding to zero or the display to none. And with these atomic classes, there might be about 3,000 of them. Right? It's not going to cover every single thing. It might say padding zero, padding 25, nice little spread and most of your common colors. After that's done, very little is updated. You don't touch it again. Um, and then we take these classes, we take our pretty much set CSS uh, style sheet, and we apply them inline. So depending on your background, that might be a little bit, uh, sound like a bad practice to put them in line, but it actually gives us three components of functional programming right in our styles. First, uh, we can say that our styles have now become contextually transparent, which is a fancy way of saying whenever we apply a style function, i.e. put a class in line somewhere, we know it's going to do exactly what we want. The color text on this top line uh, center text on this top line is going to center the text here. We're in, there's no doubt about it. Uh, second, our styles are now side effect free because applying an inline style is not going to affect anything else in your application. And third, we maintain the composability we had in the first place uh, because we can apply as many styles in line as we want. Also, uh, as an added benefit, our code documents exactly what styles we apply. So you don't have to go and search the CSS to understand what a class is doing to your uh, design. So um, what I have here, this example is actually some uh, functional CSS I wrote. Uh, the class names aren't real and they're not used widely, but they do give a, a pretty clear example. The library I've been using is actually called Tachyons. And that syntax might be a little bit unfamiliar, but it's doing the exact same thing. It uses a little bit more brevity so that you can save on typing, but padding zero is 
PA0 and white, or color white is just white. Uh, let's look at an example. On the left here, we have an item card for a uh, photo available in some animal photography store. Um, we see a variety of font sizes, colors, justifications, and displays. And then on the right, we have the HTML and CSS uh, that makes this possible. And I want to highlight a few elements of the Tachyons library, uh, just so you feel more familiar. The very first one says BR2. That stands for border radius to rem, and it's setting the border around our box. Right? And similarly, if you look below that, there's a W-100 and a W-50-20-M. That's how Tachyons handles breakpoints. So if you're switching to functional CSS, you're not losing any functionality. You can still do everything you might want to. Um, the question now becomes, what happens if we are on a medium-sized thing, you know, something where W-50-M is being applied, right? We have a width that's going to take 50% of our screen, and we have another element. If we have to apply styles inline, we'd have to have all this text on our other element as well. That sounds kind of painful, and we wouldn't really want to have to maintain it if we wanted to change our styles, which is why we're going to use React. We're going to wrap up that same element we just had in uh, a React component, and we're going to abstract the key properties that we need to change. Um, this is going to be, uh, this approach isn't specific to functional CSS, but the two technologies complement each other really well. Um, it's also nice to keep in mind that if we were working to make a style or a class like this in traditional CSS, we'd be going back to our style sheet and updating styles there, possibly culling from what we had in the past, or doing some uh, strange things with specificity. Um, so the benefits also compound if we want to come back and edit this component down the line. Uh, we know exactly where we would need to go if we wanted to change our styles. Um, and we could just right here change them without having any other effect on our app, right? We wouldn't lose. Uh, any, we would have no side effects in any other place if we wanted to redesign this item card. So uh, now that we have this React component, we can use it and make our uh, item cards for our dog, our cat, and our bear photography in one line. Um, they're all styled in a uniform way, um, and it's easy to maintain. It's easy to change if we need to. It's easy to debug. Um, and somebody coming to our code base can really easily understand why uh, these look the way they do. So uh, let's recap a bit. Uh, functional programming makes for better applications and happier developers. Functional CSS incorporates uh, the ideas of immutability, transparency, and composability into our styles. Uh, it's easy to learn and apply either on your own or with uh, one of the popular libraries out there. And by building React containers around our functional CSS, uh, we can get well-designed code that's easy to understand and maintain. Thank you.